Phil Ayers, in your book, To Teach, you talk about teachers having a moral choice. What is that moral choice? Well, I think that teaching is profoundly ethical work, and the moral choice is to choose to take the side of the students, to choose to see them as three-dimensional creatures um, with hearts and minds and spirits that somehow have to be both nourished and challenged, and to see yourself as somebody who is in the position of shepherding the choices of others. And, and that gives you a very profound, I think, uh, ethical responsibility. So part of it is to see the students whole, to see them as human beings, not as little interchangeable cogs in a machine, not as infinitely manipulatable, uh, but to see them as, as human beings much like yourself and to open your eyes to that. As individuals? As individuals and as members of a community, both. And, and that's one of the tensions of teaching right there is that you have, if you're teaching third grade and you have 25 kids, you have a responsibility to see each one as the one and only, induplicable. Um, uh, no one else will ever trod the earth quite this way, and that's essential. On the other hand, they're members of a community and have to figure out, you have to figure out how to help them learn to live together, so it's both. Throughout your books on teaching and on being an educator, you always, social justice seems to be a theme throughout all those books. In fact, one of your books is called Teaching for Social Justice. What do you mean by that? Uh, it's taken on the kind of tone of a, something special or some kind of an add-on, but what I mean by it is very simple, which is that teaching in a democracy, at least theoretically, is teaching quite a different, uh, it's quite a different approach to teaching than teaching in any kind of authoritarian or autocratic system. Whatever they teach in, you know, fascist Germany or Soviet Russia or medieval Saudi Arabia or apartheid South Africa, and those systems, incidentally, all wanted their kids to stay away from drugs and crime, show up on time, learn the subject matters, uh, you know, all those kinds of things, which we want as well. Um, the, but there's something distinctly different about teaching in a democracy, and the difference is social justice. So one way to put it is that whatever else they teach in those systems, they teach obedience and conformity as number one hidden curriculum. Whatever else we teach, we should be teaching um, the, 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 the democratic ideal that each human being is um, precious, induplicable, induplicable uh, uh, to be treated with utter respect, uh, and, and with profound human rights. So we start from a different angle. And so whatever else we teach, we want to teach initiative, courage, imagination, creativity, entrepreneurship, things like that. Is there any case in your view in a democracy where teaching should include conformity and discipline? Well, of course, we have to be disciplined to learn to live together. I mean, that, that requires a kind of discipline. The question is, where does the discipline come from, and how is it structured and organized? I mean, if you create a classroom which is absolute chaos, or a school that's absolute chaos, nobody has an opportunity to learn at all. But if, as your fundamental value uh, in your classroom is, one of the things we're going to be doing here is respecting each individual and learning to live together. That means again and again and again, you have teachable moments. You have a moment when somebody makes a, uh, a, a cruel comment. You have some, a moment when somebody tears up somebody else's work. You have a moment when somebody makes a racial slur. These are teachable moments. They're moments when we, we use the occasion of whatever has happened to uh, open a conversation about what's fair, what's just, what's democratic. That's the distinction I make between teaching in a democracy and, say, teaching in apartheid South Africa. Well, in To Teach, you write that standardized tests should come with printed warnings. Use of these materials may be hazardous to your intelligence, or the life chances of half of those taking these tests will be narrowed. Yeah, I did write that. Why? I apologize. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, uh, because I think standardized tests, and frankly, I wrote that I think 10 or 15 years ago, and frankly, it's gotten so much worse that it's kind of hard to believe the world we live in. We have reduced education, which is always about opening doors, opening minds, opening possibilities, opening new visions and new horizons. We've reduced that to the taking of a single cognitive test that's culturally biased, that narrows the curriculum, and we've gotten to a point after kind of eight years of, of following this regimen pretty viciously, we've gotten to a point where the only kids who have access 
to music and sports and debate and the arts and science are kids who either live in privileged suburbs or go to private schools. Kids in the city are increasingly being denied that opportunity and that's the result of a singular obsession with a silly standardized test. So the question I ask about standardized tests in the book and I've asked it really all my life as a teacher, who benefits, who doesn't benefit, who profits, who doesn't profit, and frankly I think these standardized tests are a mistake and they're a mistake because of our obsession with them and our you know, reifying of them. They do not represent intelligence. They do not represent uh, achievement. They represent something, but that something is quite narrow. Could you give an example, Bill Ayers, of what you mean by cultural bias in a standardized sure. test? Sure. When, when my kids were young, my kids are all grown, and I have a couple of granddaughters now, but when my kids were young, I remember a standardized test that my oldest son took. And there was a picture, um, it was a, I think it was first grade, it was very young. And there was a picture of, um, of people sitting on a porch. And it said, the people are sitting on the, and then they had three choices, one of which was a porch. Now, the kids that I was teaching at the time had never seen a porch, never heard of a porch, never had, a, had encountered a porch in their own reading, in the stories that they'd been read. So how were they to answer that? Now, of course, I grew up with a porch, so I might be able to answer that quite easily. What if we gave a test to kids in central Iowa where we drew a set of rectangular boxes and we said the people are living in the, and we gave three choices, one of which was projects. Not one of those kids would get it right. And why wouldn't they? Because it's a cultural thing. So that's not about intelligence, that's not about ability, that's about experience and cultural background. So again and again, what we're testing for, and this is the shame of it, and it's the shame that somehow dares not be spoken, but the shame of standardized tests is that, is that all they tell us is what we already know. The clearest indicator of how you'll do on any standardized test is how you did on the first one you ever took. The clearest indicator of how you'll do on the first one is the educational level and income of your parents. That's a pretty horrible statement for an educator to, to swallow because I don't want to say to my kids, okay, line up. What, how much do your parents make? Okay, you stand over there. How far did your parents go in school? You stand over there. I want to believe that as an educator, I can make a difference in the life experiences and the opportunities of kids, but I can't do it if I'm obsessing every day and if my job depends on my kids' scores on this test. Well, Bill Ayers is our guest on In Depth this month, and we're going to put the phone lines up on the screen if you want to participate in our conversation. We are live in Chicago. We're at the corner of South State Street and Congress, and just south of the Loop in downtown Chicago. And this is the Chicago Tribune's Printer's Row Lit Fest that is going on this weekend. We also have a studio audience here joining us at the University Center where we are doing our live in depth. 202 is the area code, 737 -0001. If you live in the east and central time zones and would like to talk with Bill Ayers, 202-737-0002 for those of you in the mountain and Pacific time zones. And we'll begin taking your calls in just a few minutes. But first we want to look at some of Mr. Ayers' books on education. Teaching Toward Freedom is one of his books. Another one is called Zero Tolerance, Resisting the Drive for Punishment in Our Schools. We have Teaching the Personal and the Political, Essays on Hope and Justice. City Kids and City Schools. Now these are books that are edited by Mr. Ayers and uh, with several different contributors in this. This is uh, City Kids and City Teachers, Reports from the Front Row. And this is City Kids and City Schools, More Reports from the Front Rows. These are just some of his education books. And we'll get into some of his other books also as we go. This is To Teach, which also contains the myth of education. What are some of the myths of education that you Gosh, I wrote that 15 years ago. You're asking me to remember the yes, myths? Yes, I am. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, what I, what I, when I wrote the book, I was taken with the fact that when you go to colleges of education, when you become a teacher, you get kind of surrounded with these myths. And, and some of them are things like uh, kids today are different than kids ever were in the world, that these are the toughest kids, the worst kids. That's been said by every generation ever. And uh, now that I'm old, I feel myself wanting to say it about young people today. It's just not true. Kids are kids. Kids experiment. Kids try things. Kids do things. And, and so one myth is kids today are different than ever before. Another myth is that, t that I remember writing is uh, teaching should be fun. 
And I, you know, I, I argue that it can be deeply satisfying, it can be um, you know, enormously rewarding, but, but the idea that a teacher should be fun seems to me a little bit like you've put on a clown costume and dance around. That doesn't strike me as, as particularly correct. Um, uh,